And just like that, the NBA trade deadline is officially over. What's good with everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Gifted Who's Podcast, episode 45 specifically. It's been a long time coming, but we're back. These are going to be dropping regularly on Wednesdays and Saturdays. That's what I'm going to try to do. Try to hold me to that. But we're back, and today we're going to be recapping the NBA trade deadline. Obviously, a lot of trades went down, so we got to get to everything. Make sure to follow this podcast, Give This Podcast, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and also YouTube for the video version. Appreciate y'all's support. But let's get to it, man. I'm so excited. So, okay, it's been a while, right? But for this trade deadline, a lot happened and a lot didn't happen. And today... I want to really recap the biggest moves and the biggest non-moves made from a bunch of teams. So I got to say for me, if I'm looking at all the teams in the trade deadline, I think the biggest winners had to be between the Mavericks, had to be between the Celtics, and last but not least, the New York Knicks. I think those three teams had the most dominant trade deadline. And I kind of want to start off with the Boston Celtics first because I get it, right? They didn't really make any crazy moves, but for you to trade uh, draft capital to get a backup big as insurance for Porzingis' health in Al Horford, I thought that was great. Xavier Tillman, for those of you that don't know, is a phenomenal backup big man in this league. I think he can play basketball at a pretty good level. And we saw in the playoffs last year, literally, He had moments where he was holding his own against Anthony Davis. Now, obviously, he's not the caliber player Anthony Davis is and not even close. But the fact that he was able to come in and produce in the playoffs is pretty good. And you're telling me that he's now their backup biggest insurance because we know Porzingis has been slightly injury prone this season. You can also have Al Horford. And if anything happens to one of those bigs, you really have no other big presence to go to. So I think for Tillman in this role for Boston, to buy in and go through the motions with those, I think that was just a, a great, phenomenal trade. And only have to really give up on a second-round pick and not really trade any players. I think Boston is in pole position to still be one of the better teams in the NBA to potentially make a run and get to the finals. So shout-out to the Celtics, man. That was a huge trade. Um, obviously, we got to talk about the Mavericks. I got to say, man, the Dallas Mavericks made a phenomenal move during the deadline. I got to say... P.J. Washington is one of the most versatile fours in the association. I think he's a very good player. And he was kind of wasting away in Charlotte because, as we know, Charlotte isn't really a competitive uh, overall destination. But for P.J. Washington, what he unlocks for Dallas is they now have a legitimate front court because they not only didn't get just P.J., but they also got Daniel Gafford, who is another athletic big can dunk the ball, block shots around the rim. I mean, completely revamping their front court by getting rid of Grant Williams' salary and also Seth Curry. I don't see how that's not a win. Now, granted, they did give up a lightly protected first-round pick. Um, I do definitely understand that. But if you're telling me that the main thing that you're giving up is Grant Williams and Rashawn Holmes and you're getting all this capital back and Seth Curry, I mean, I think you do it eight times out of 10 for the Dallas Mavericks. And to me, this is a build that is kind of mirroring what they did in 2022, where they traded for Spencer Dinwiddie at the trade deadline. They put their team together and they went on a crazy run that people didn't expect them to. Only this time you have Kyrie Irving replacing Jalen Brunson that year. They might be able to sign Spencer Dinwiddie off of the buyout market, which is another thing that we got to get into later, but they get that. But now you have Gafford, and you also have P.J. as your front court. And guys, remember, they drafted Derek Lively, and he's been a NBA caliber player at a pretty good level for the Dallas Mavericks in terms of rebounding, passing, and attacking the short roll in space. So now that you have another big to add, it just gives them way more lineup flexibility and rotations. You can have maybe some small stretches where P.J. is at the five, and you truly go with a dedicated small ball, right? Like, you could do that against certain matchups. So, like, the flexibility between having all three bigs, especially because Lively has kind of had some injuries this season, it's a great insurance for the Dallas Mavericks, and it's a great sign to really revamp their team. Because to me, a good team, like, it's one thing to have a star player from the perimeter. 
obviously that's going to matter. That's going to be super important. But for you to have a four that can space the floor, play defense, switch, uh, operate in the pick and roll if needed, those things matter for any championship team. If you look at the Denver Nuggets last year, Aaron Gordon, very versatile for arguably one of the most, if not the most versatile for in the NBA in terms of role players, right? So now you have P.J., over to Dallas I just think that's a phenomenal fit and he's never played with a guy like Luca where Luca can really impact the game at all levels as a pick and roll playmaker I understand LaMelo is a great playmaker as well but I just think that there are two different tiers of guys and I think Luca will better maximize PJ especially in a system that really can get out and they generate a ton of quality looks from the corner I think PJ is going to thrive in Dallas so Dallas Mavericks, man, they're really up there in terms of one of the better teams in terms of winners for the trade deadline. So that was great for them. Um, The next one, which we were talking about, the New York Knicks. Guys, the Knicks made a ton of moves, man. Um, Okay, first off, trading for OG Ananobi. We got to start with there. Trading for OG Ananobi, to me, that was a phenomenal move for the New York Knicks to make. I was very impressed with getting him. I understand that they had to trade R.J. Barrett and Emmanuel quickly. But the Knicks did not have to give up any first-round compensation. They gave up a second-round pick, sure, but they kept asset flexibility. They got OG and Anobi. And then guess what else? For the trade deadline, they add Bojan and Alec Burks to the unit. First off, let's keep in mind what Bojan Bogdanovic's value was, right? A year ago, Bojan, his market was two first round picks but the Pistons didn't want to do the trade so a year later you're telling me that the New York Knicks are able to get Bojan Bogdanovic added to the roster another capable ball handler who, who can play off ball shoot the three and really score in bunches when you need him to I think you can trust Bojan to lead a second unit and for him I think he'll fit in perfectly with the New York Knicks especially considering that right now Randall and OG are injured so they actually need production from someone else and then Alec Burks to me is another guy that can come in and just be a variance role player who can space the floor and knock down some big time shots so I think for the Knicks phenomenal trade um a lot of second round pick stuff but now beyond that their build moving forward just looks extremely potent and you can finagle another piece remember the Knicks still have all their first round picks so if a star player becomes available you can add them on this roster that seems ready to, you know, win with one more big piece. So I like it for the Knicks, man. I truly, truly do. I feel like a lot of people slander them because they've been bad for many, many years. But I think the the cap flexibility and the decision making from the front office over the past few years, you got to respect it, man. So I'm really impressed with what the Knicks were able to do. Another team that I kind of want to get to is the Lakers. Uh, I think the Lakers are probably one of the biggest losers of the NBA trade deadline. Um, they didn't really make any move at all whatsoever. Um, they weren't able to trade for DeJounte Murray, which in my opinion, I didn't think DeJounte Murray was going to be the answer anyway. They couldn't trade for Zach Levine, who was out for the entire season. I think you could argue with his contract that might not have been the best fit anyway because of his injury history. But to be fair, I mean, as a three-level scorer, I think he would have probably been the most ideal fit if healthy for the Lakers in the first place to me, but they didn't make any move. Um, this is a roster that has underperformed for the majority of the season. They're currently out of the uh, playoff race. They're in the play-in though, which is good for them. Um, they're starting to win a, a bit more games, but it's just questionable in terms of the ceiling of this roster around two top 10 players in LeBron and Anthony Davis. And for you to make no moves at all whatsoever with, LeBron having a player option coming forward. I think it's extremely questionable. The variance of this team offensively just has not been a great thing. Torian Prince has been a disaster for them, even though he winds up shooting 39% from three. His overall impact on the game just simply hasn't been felt. Austin Reeves has been one of the most disappointing players for this upcoming season. And now the fact that they signed him and they have extended him, I don't think people thought that D'Lo would considerably be a better player than Austin Reeves. But for the majority of the season, that's what D'Lo has been. So for them to not get enough guard production 
They might need to get Spencer Dinwiddie off of a buyout, but even Spencer Dinwiddie in moments has not been maximized in Brooklyn. And there's a chance that if he goes over to LA, it might be more of the same thing. So very questionable stuff for the Lakers to not really improve your roster at all and just go with the flow, especially with Vanderbilt potentially being out for the season. So I got to say the Lakers are probably one of the top three biggest losers of this current NBA trade deadline. So that's tough for them. I want to segue to the Sixers, though. I think the Sixers are a very interesting team when you look at their position, right? So reports came out that Daryl Morey wanted to try to get a star player, which makes sense, right? I mean, no Joel Embiid right now. Getting a star player to hold down the fort if he comes back this season makes a ton of sense. But ultimately, the name wasn't really out there. The only guy they could target is DeMar DeRozan, who plays for a team that we got to get to next because they got to be the biggest loser. Like, all, <laughs> sorry. The Bulls have to be the biggest loser of the entire trade deadline to me. But before we get to them, I think the fact that this team is a team that came in struggling, not knowing exactly what to do or who to target... DeRozan would not have been the thing to save the Philadelphia 76ers. I think losing the heart and soul of the team, which I know he's only been there for some time, but I like what Patrick Beverly was able to provide to the 76ers. And now their POA defense seems questionable. They traded Jaden Springer to the Celtics for a second round pick. To me, this is Daryl Morey loading up assets to make another move in the offseason, not this current season. There is a chance that he's just going to accept mediocrity from the Sixers team to where they can get a higher draft pick. I don't know if they bottom out all the way because they still have talented players on the roster. But with no Joel Embiid, this team just simply isn't going to be as productive as it was before. And I would think that to err on the side of caution, they're going to sit Joel Embiid for the rest of the season. Now, I know that the wording of it, he's out for like six to eight you know, weeks. He might be able to come back. But realistically... For Joel Embiid, once you come back from injury, it's not like he's just automatically the same 36 points per game player. You have to come back and then work yourself back in the NBA shape. And then if we're assuming that he misses the entire regular season, you're coming back in your first games into the playoffs. That sounds like a disaster for him to come back to. I don't think that makes much sense. I think the smarter move is to just give up on the season, get Joel Embiid healthy because that should be the number one priority. And then with the assets and the expiry that, that you do have, you make a splash in the offseason for somebody. Throw your picks at whoever becomes available. But emphasizing Joel Embiid's health has to be the number one priority for the Sixers. So overall, I give them like a C. It was a weird trade deadline for them. But when your best player gets injured, it's not really much you can do to, you know, really make a steadfast big type of move. So that's kind of tough for them. Uh, Pacers. I don't know if people want to count this, but I, I do count Siakam going on to the team as a part of this. I know it happened quite earlier before the deadline, but I think for them to come into the season and make a splash like that was pretty big. Again, as we stated before in that video, I feel like for them to add Pascal Siakam was a pretty strong move for the Pacers. I understand that they gave up uh, draft capital, but two of those draft picks are coming from this season. If they're able to make a run with Siakam, and Tyrese Halliburton, I think they'll be fine in terms of, you know, that give up. Because outside of this, there's no other way for the Pacers to really get a star player like Pascal Siakam back. So to me, that's not crazy. I don't really think that's a, a bad thing for them. Um, I will say trading Buddy Hill, they got capital back for him. His name was in trade talks for quite some time now. And they were able to make direct moves with the Sixers. So for the Pacers, it's, it's like a C. I kind of think you already made your big move already with Siakam. So now it's just about getting continuity, finding your best lineups, uh, trying to maximize Aaron Neesmith, who's been very, very good the entire year with these lineups. I just think it's more of the same for them. So to me, that's a team that was there. And then you have my team, the Golden State Warriors. Yeah, I'm looking dead into the camera on YouTube when I say this. Um, the Golden State Warriors are also one of the biggest losers of the trade deadline they did pretty much nothing the only thing that i personally love that they did is they were able to trade Corey joseph and they got a second round pick back they had to trade like 5.8 million dollars worth of cash to get it done 
But ultimately, I think Corey Joseph being off of this roster is for the better. First off, he started not playing finally, which is great. But the fact that we were employing this man and he was playing 10 minutes to 18 minutes and literally was not a force or factor in the game for the most part at all whatsoever. The only thing he really did was not turn the ball over, but that's because he was a very conservative player. There were so many moments where I'm sitting there watching the games, y'all, and I'm seeing Corey Joseph not do anything where he's just passing, passing, passing. He's not shooting. Or when he does catch the ball to shoot, most of the times when he got minutes, he would be stepping out of bounds and it would be a turnover. So to me, seeing him off my team is very, very good. I think Kerr finally does not have an excuse to play Corey Joseph because he kept ranting and raving about how, oh, Corey Joseph is great. Whenever I give him minutes and time, he looks very, very good. And that's not the case. Corey Joseph is not a great NBA talent. So to me, ridding yourself of that is good. But you didn't make any other impactful move. Chris Paul's contract is, is something you could have traded to come off of because the next year is partially guaranteed. You didn't make any move with that. You weren't able to trade Andrew Wiggins, who has bigger salary coming in that you're going to have to lock yourself into. Maybe you bank on him becoming a, a much better player for the rest of the season or next year. But up to this point, he's been pretty bad. Like, I would say one of the worst role players in the NBA in terms of consistency, pretty bad. And you weren't able to make any type of move to, you know, needle move this roster to a better situation to at least being like a playoff caliber team now they're just banking on the heroics of Steph Curry Draymond Green and potentially getting healthy with Chris Paul and it's just not a great situation I said this coming in I did not think the Warriors were contenders this season I did not think that they were a tier one team they've significantly underperformed even to that standard if you did not make any moves around that I think it's kind of weak but I think a lot of their grade is going to have to come to what they're able to do in the offseason. When Clay's contract for $41 million comes off of the books, when you have Chris Paul's contract being a partially guaranteed contract that you can still try to flip, there's there's things that can be done, but it's hard to see say what it's going to look like, especially considering that the key players that you would think are on the board in the offseason aren't going to be that good either. I don't know. It's a weird spot, but... I'm happy to be watching basketball. So they've won, I think, five of their last six. So just, I guess, keep that going. I don't know. They also have one of the easiest schedules remaining in basketball after this, like, four to five game stretch that's coming up for the Warriors. So that's good. But, man, very, very questionable. Questionable stuff. So, yeah, Warriors and Lakers both have aging superstars, and they have not done anything to maximize their current situations. It's just more of the same. So, very tough, but it'd be like that sometimes. Um, What else? Oh, yeah. The Bucks getting... Okay, this is interesting. The Bucks getting Patrick Beverly. The fact that Patrick Beverly is going to come on this roster and be the best impact POA guy is nasty work. I think it goes to show you that the roster was flawed. I said this after the Giannis trade and people got on my head. I said, guys, Giannis is a great basketball player. But can you name the other players on this team that are going to impact routinely defensively? They fire Adrian Griffin before the trade deadline, and they now have Doc Rivers through the trade deadline. This this roster is not a good basketball roster to me. I think that they lose a ton of leads, and I don't think they really made any impact trade outside of getting Patrick Beverly. And by the way, this is after there are multiple reports of, oh, the Bucks they're interested in Andrew Wiggins. They want Caruso. They want this player and that player. And you wind up getting Patrick Beverly. Not really much of a crazy needle mover, but we'll see what happens, man. Um, that was a thing that they did indeed do. Um, something else that is super key here, which I said before, we got to get into now. The biggest loser of the trade deadline is the Chicago Bulls. There's no way around it. I think the biggest loser is, is Chicago. I think the reason why is you had a chance to blow up the roster. You could have traded DeMar DeRozan. You could have potentially tried to trade Vucevic. You could have literally just reset what your franchise was. And the fact that they didn't, because they said that they want to keep DeMar DeRozan long-term and they want to just keep the current build of this team going, 
I think it's asinine. I think it's complete mismanagement of a basketball team. The fact that the Bulls have only made one trade in, in like the past, I think, six to seven years is crazy. I just don't understand what the vision is for this team. Because initially, when they traded for Lonzo and DeMar DeRozan, okay, the the build and fit made sense. But even in that season where they were very, very dominant for stretches, remember, they were, were still not beating teams above 500. And Lonzo's not healthy anymore. Lonzo has played basketball in like two years. So you don't know what he's going to be in terms of a player or an asset next season. Zach Levine is out for the entire season already. He's making a bunch of money as well. You had a chance to really just completely hard reset. Uh, go with Kobe White as your future piece who's been dominant this season after Levine went down. And rebuild from there. And instead, there was no retooling or rebuilding. They made Alice Caruso untouchable. And see, moves like that is crazy to me because as good as Alice Caruso is, his value is probably at the highest it is now. When he gets older, if he gets another injury or if some bad things go down to Caruso, you're not going to get the value from Caruso that you could have gotten if you traded him now. So to me, this is like really questionable for the Bulls. I don't know what their direction is because they're also not a great team right now. And the fact that Drummond wasn't moved, Caruso wasn't moved, DeRozan wasn't moved, Patrick Williams wasn't moved. Like, they they literally made no move at all whatsoever. I think that's really, really bad management for a team that literally is just stuck and has no direction. The Bulls are a joke. I'm sorry to say that, but they are a absolute joke based off how they carry their trade deadline. To me, they are the biggest losers just off the simple fact that they don't know where they're going. And for most teams, even for the Warriors and the Lakers that didn't make any moves, at least you could argue to yourself, okay, well, they have this or that that they can potentially try to do in the offseason. They have their draft capital. Like, maybe something could happen. Even though there's still bad situations, the Bulls make zero sense. It's, it's a layup to rebuild that team at this point. So, tough spot for them to be in, man. I must say, uh, tough spot. I do want to get over to the Suns. The Suns made some moves, man. They traded a lot of their bigger players. Um, they were able to get Royce O'Neal back, which is pretty good. Just having an another guy that can play defense, shoot the ball. I, I think Royce can fit pretty well. He's hit 36% of his threes this current season. They also got David Roddy. I don't know what uh, he's going to really get in their rotation, but... The Suns are a weird team because they've always had a bunch of hypothetical, uh, you know, value players. Like, this guy could be a rotation player or he could not play any minutes at all. I think they still have that existing on the roster, but getting Royce O'Neal at least is a solid enough move. I just don't know how much of a needle-moving type of move it really is, but that's to be determined. This Suns roster is still in flux. I think, you know, Bradley Beal... Um, is an injury-prone player, but as of late, he's been playing slightly better. Kevin Durant is really, really starting to put it together at a high, high level. Booker's been slightly inconsistent, but we know how good of a talent he is. This roster is really built on their big three and as far as their big three can take them, so we'll see where that gets them in the playoffs. But man, I just think there's there's a lot of questionable things for this Suns roster moving forward. I give them like, like a C plus, B minus. Like, it's okay. I don't think it really moves any needle like that dramatically. Uh, the Jazz made some moves as well. They traded Kelly Olenek and Ochai Abaji. Um, they were able to get a 2024 pick. I forget about it. It was like one one slightly, slightly protected first round pick. But the fact that they were able to get any draft capital for them. This Jazz team is a team that is just going to try to compete as much as possible. But still bottom out. Still get some good draft. Uh, compensation and then make some other moves they've still been one of the most competitive uh teams and still one of the best stories in the nba uh lori marketing for them has been spectacular it's been an all nba caliber player this season and also colin sexton has emerged he's been playing phenomenal basketball i just love how they play will hardy continues to be one of the best coaches in the nba so for them their vision is really just more so player development and getting as many assets as you can and they were able to do that so i'm not mad at the moves that they made at all whatsoever but that's cool for them they open up some more minutes for keontae george and some other young players to play so solid 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 let's get to the okc thunder though 
okay? The OKC Thunder, they get Gordon Hayward on their roster. I feel a way about this, and it's not because of the Josh Giddy situation. For me, it's more so the fact that for OKC, you didn't really make a move to get a backup big as insurance. I think that team needed size and some type of like length to, you know, serve as protection for Chet in the playoffs to have some type of bigger body for those bigger types of teams. They didn't really do that. But I do think Gordon Hayward fits into everything OKC wants to do as a ball handler, as a wing scorer, as a shooter. I think he can fit in to a very simple role there. And more importantly, he's a veteran player that, you know, has played against good teams, has played on pro teams, has, you know, done things in the playoffs in terms of being in those moments. And I think having him on OKC is pretty good to have some type of veteran player that can actually still play basketball. So I think it's cool. I still would have liked them to get an actual big back. I did think that the salary that they flipped with Bertans could have got them potentially more value, but I'm not upset. You know, that trade makes sense. I'm not going to say that that's a crazy bad trade. And then you have the Wolves, who another team that's at, currently at the top of the Western Conference right now. Uh, the Wolves were able to get Monte Morris, which again, I've said this. Getting Monte Morris as your backup for Mike Conley to me is a phenomenal move. It's a move a lot of people are not going to talk about. But you go from not having a true backup creator on nights where Mike Conley isn't there to Monte Morris, who ha has done a lot in this league, and I think is a phenomenal backup. I think having him as your backup guard makes a ton of sense, and it adds to your depth more than it takes away. It didn't really have to give up much. All they had to trade was uh, Shake Milton, Troy Brown. Those guys weren't really getting much minutes and a 2020 second round pick. So to me, I'm sorry, 2030 second round pick. So to me, it's not as bad as some people might say it is. I think Monty can come in and contribute right now. And this Wolves team, this is the best we've ever seen them. I say coming into the season, this Wolves team could be a team that could really be a very good team to handle business and get further in the playoffs. So to me, it makes a ton, a ton of sense for them to make a move like this. So to me, Monty Morris really impacts winning at a high level and could work for this Minnesota team that is trying to go further than they ever have. So to me, I like that stuff. So that was really good for them. And after that, it's really crickets. Uh, honestly, a lot of these other teams really didn't make any big moves. I can mention the Simone Pontecchio move, but no <laughs> so yeah that was the trade deadline to recap um the biggest loser to me is the chicago bulls i think they were the biggest loser of the trade deadline i think the biggest winner is between the mavericks and the knicks if, if you're making me choose i think based off of the roster construction i kind of want to say the mavericks because having a really good front court now to reset their stuff when Luka and Kyrie are healthy I just think that team's much more of a threat than they were before I think PJ is a good value add so to me those are, are the biggest winners and losers of the trade deadline uh before we get out of here there are a couple things that I want to address shout out to the Clippers man okay shout out to the Clippers I think by the last podcast they were not winning a ton of games they were losing at that current moment I remember James Harden was traded there a lot of people uh, tried to use three-game sample size bias to say that um, it was much better with Russ being there. And by the way, I'm a Russ fan, so this is not me hating on Russ. But the idea that a a small sample size stretched like that compared to like five or six games with James Harden meant more is crazy. And ever since that moment, they turned things around dramatically. This is the same team that we saw get blown out by 30 points to the Dallas Mavericks based off a lineup that had Bones Highland, Russ, and didn't have uh, Harden, Paul George, or Kawhi in the lineup at all. This is the same team that literally was playing the Denver Nuggets. They had, I'm pretty sure, no Jokic or, or Jamal Murray. They got cooked by Reggie Jackson and DeAndre Jordan in the year of 2024. And this is a team that's been dominant ever since that point. They've just been stacking win after win after win after win. Their offense looks so much better the process and the urgency you see a lot better. They generate really high quality shots. James Harden has been spectacular as a playmaker and a pull-up shooter for their team. Kawhi Leonard has looked like an MVP candidate. He's been playing phenomenal two-way basketball, like very, very 
good hoops. Paul George, uh, a bit rough for his last 10 games, but overall, Paul George has been a very good player for the Clippers this season. He started out the year as their best player, and this seems a threat, man. Like, Russ is, is fully brought into his bench role as a guy that comes in, can give energy, can push pace, and it just makes sense. Also, Tice has been a lot better for them than I thought he would be, and their defense has been the story. I mean, even though they're still undersized, what they've done defensively to lock in and really put pressure on teams, they've been dominating teams. So shout out to the Clippers, man. Top four seed in the Western Conference, far, far away from the play-in. Got to respect that for them. The other team that I think deserves a lot of credit and a ton of respect and love has to be the Cleveland Cavaliers. Yes, no one talks about them. On the Gifted Who's podcast today, we're going to talk about them. The Cleveland Cavaliers have been one of the most impressive teams in basketball. They've won uh, 16 of their last 17 games, I think, which is so crazy. They've just been stacking up win after win after win. Donovan Mitchell, uh, he's not going to win it, obviously, but I think he should be mentioned in terms of his value to the Cavs as an MVP player. Because remember, Zach Levine's been out. Mobley's been out. Jared Allen has been so phenomenal for them. Big shout out to him. But what Donovan's been able to do as their primary ball handler and decision maker, he's having a very strong season. I know the numbers, like he's, I'm pretty sure right now he's shooting like 36 or 35% from three. That's fine. But, but over his last like 10 or 15, he's been dominant, putting up like 25 to 30 points per game. The decision making has been great. The downhill drives have been great. He's just been a great all-star player for them. And the Cavs look very, very live. Once they figure out how to work everyone back in, I think they're going to still be a very good team. This team has a lot more shooting. You're seeing Evan Mobley try to take that step to shoot more threes from the perimeter as well to really expand his game. And Jared Allen has been great. So I, I like this Cavs team from that perspective because they were a team that was literally at the bottom of the conference, like near seven or eight. And then once those two guys went down, everyone said the Cavs were done. And they ran up 16 wins. So, so hey, got to respect that. But I don't want to make this podcast too long. Um, I want to say thank you to everyone who's had a lot of patience. I haven't really recorded in a very long time for the podcast. But we're going to start rolling these out again. We're going to do two a week. The goal is the drop days are going to be on Wednesdays and on Saturdays. That's the goal. If I'm not able to keep that up, I don't know. We'll see. But my communication on the YouTube channel and all that's going to be there. If you don't know where to find this podcast, you can find it on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube for the video version. Make sure to like, you know, comment, subscribe. All those things really help me grow and whatnot. And yeah, we're going to head out of here. Um, I don't know what the Lakers are doing with LeBron James, but we'll see what happens. Peace out, people. Have a good one.